It is an honor to represent W.L. Gorn Associates, a foundational supporter of the Flagstaff Festival of Science since the beginning of the festival. Our Gore Associates, both locally in Flagstaff and globally, are changing the world with creativity, an incredible drive to make the world a better place through the application of technology. Gore's Arizona operation innovates and makes medical devices that both improve and save lives. In the last 40 plus years, more than 45 million Gore medical devices have been implanted around the world. Gore believes that together we are improving life. And now I'd like to tell you about our featured guest in the 2020 W.L. Gorn Associates keynote presentation. Krista Sadler is an earth scientist and the kind of friend most of us would love to have alongside us. Whether we're hiking around the Red Rocks of Sedona, running the rapids in the Colorado River, or on a kayaking adventure in the Sea of Cortez. Krista is the type of person who feels most at home when she's out in the wildlands. As a little girl, she loved nothing more than playing in the dirt and exploring the world around her. Today, her interest in geology, archaeology, and paleontology have her pursuing her passions, creating student field trips in the Grand Canyon, learning about prehistoric people across the Colorado Plateau, searching for dinosaur fossils in the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, and writing about scientific subjects for the public. One of her passions is to share the wonders of discovery with people all over the world. In fact, she founded One New Education, a nonprofit organization that awards scholarships to girls in developing countries. Through this work, Krista helps them achieve their educational goals. This evening, we are tapping into the superpowers of science with Flagstaff's Krista Sadler. Hi, my name is Krista Sadler, and I want to welcome you to the Flagstaff Festival of Science, 31st annual, I believe it is this year. And um, this is a really exciting event. I is one of the things I love about living in Flagstaff is that we have a festival of science that is renowned throughout the United States and even in other parts of the world. So I'm really glad you're here. And today we are going to talk about science. But not just science, we're going to talk about science, what it is, how do we do it, and how you can get involved. Um, the theme of this year's festival is the superpowers of science, and so I decided to call this tapping into the superpowers of science. But not just the superpowers that science has for us, but also your own superpower to get involved in science. And it's an amazingly cool pursuit to do science in any number of ways. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, but first, I want to talk a little bit about me, who I am, introduce you to, to uh, my life, which has revolved around science for as long as I can remember. So this is not me. This is um, another superpower, another superhero uh, scientist. But this is me. For as long as I can remember, I have loved being outside, digging in the dirt, busting things up, uh, digging things up. But I'm also a scientist. I'm a paleontologist. I was trained in paleontology, and that is somebody who studies the um, ancient life on Earth. These are some pictures of me digging in, the, digging in the ground. The middle one, I'm in Mongolia. You might notice the uh, camels in the background. Those were our, our local um, visitors when we would dig things up. And then some of the fossils I've dug up, if you're a fossil, if you're a dinosaur specialist, you might recognize the name Oviraptor. The one on the right is the arm with two fingers and claws of an Oviraptor. Um, basically, I love all kinds of fossils though. Um, on the left there, you'll see me, I am looking at a trackway in, that uh, is in the Grand Canyon. These are reptile tracks. And on the right, I'm looking around at worm burrows. 500 million year old worm burrows. So I just really love all kinds of fossils. And whenever I can get out in the field, I love it. Um, just last week, actually, I was out in Utah in Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. And I was working on digging up a crocodile. And that one on the top left there is the thigh bone, the femur of a big duck billed dinosaur. So pretty much I love all kinds of fossils and what we can learn from them. Um, but I'm also a river guide. I work in the Grand Canyon. I work in Alaska, which is, you see me on the bottom, uh, wearing substantially more clothing than I do in the Grand Canyon. Um, I'm also a sea kayaking guide. I work sometimes in Lake Powell, sometimes in Baja, California. I do backpacking trips. I work as a backpacking guide. I'm also an author. I've written several books about paleontology, 
and other forms of natural history. And then I'm also an educator. And the great thing about what I do with, with my educating, with my classes, is that I teach everything from little tiny kids. You can see the guys up on the left. They were loving the fossils. Uh, the ones on the right, is that's a college class in Grand Canyon. And then down on the lower left is a group of uh, grown-ups, adults. So I will pretty much work with anyone who will listen <laughs> and anyone who wants to learn about our planet, pretty much. I really just love this planet. And everything that I do, whether it's the writing I do or the teaching I do, um, even the guiding and the interpretation that I do, that is always revolving around science. Um, Archaeology, uh, geology, paleontology, biology, ecology. I'm always utilizing the science that people have done in the past. And um, I'm trying to basically um, translate that for the public. So science has been a huge part of my life and it is one of the coolest things ever. Now, I brought a few of my favorite things to show you guys. So we're gonna have a couple of these fossil intermissions. Um, I wanna start, and each one of these has a story. I wanna start with this guy. It's a little guy. You might be able to see he's very shiny and the backside looks more like mother of pearl. And this is called an ammonite and sort of related to a squid um, or an octopus. And if you know what a nautilus is, sort of distantly related to a nautilus. So it's a coiled um, squid-like creature. The shell is coiled and he lived in this outermost um, sort of section and they would spurt along in the water and move backwards. But what's really cool about this fossil, you notice the gold. All the kids, when I give them, you know, when I show them the fossils, this one they love more than almost all the others um, because it's all shiny and gold. And it has been replaced. This is a real fossil, but it's been replaced with pyrite or fool's gold. And the reason that I wanted to show you this one, besides the fact that it's one of my favorite fossils, is that this kind of helps us understand how when people first started finding fossils, a lot of times they didn't think they were natural. They didn't think they were, they were um, you know, natural objects or they thought they were uh, something created by humans um, or pieces of art even. This is from Russia, but you find things like this you know, all over the world. And we now know, because we've been studying these things, that this is a real fossil, this is a real creature but that uh, the chemical reactions with the water when this became fossilized actually changed the structure of it into fool's gold. Um, so this is a really, and then it got polished by humans. So, but this is one of my, my favorite fossils and they're just really beautiful. And there are ammonites all over the world. Some of them are huge. This is a pretty small one, but I love that guy a lot. So I thought I would introduce you to some of my, my favorite kids here. <laughs> Okay. All right. So what is science? I want to get a little bit into the weeds here because I think it's really important to, uh, to understand what science is and how we do it. Um, because there's a lot of misunderstandings, I think, about how science works and what science is when people do it. So what is science and why is it so cool? All right, so this is a description from Wikipedia, not necessarily the best source, but um, a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the universe. It really makes you want to go study science, right? <laughs> Yikes. So yes, if you break that down, that is absolutely the description of what science is. But I like to think of it more as a process. It's a process that helps us understand how things work, how the world works, how the universe works. And we're going to go into something called the scientific method, because this is really important. Scientists are not just out there going, hey, I think I'm going to do this. There's a method that we follow um, that really helps us to do the right thing, to make sure that we're all following the same rules and that we're getting the best information we can. So this process uses what we call the scientific method. So the scientific method has several steps and I'm going to, you know, I'm sort of, I'm paring it down to, to the basics here. There's a lot more to this, but this is, you know, pretty much what we do. So the first step is you make observations and everybody makes observations every day in their life, right? Um, you make observations about something that, you're, that you see all the time and you kind of keep track of those observations. If you make enough observations that they bring a question to your mind, your second step 
is to develop a hypothesis. So the other term for a hypothesis would just be basically an educated guess. But that word educated is really important. It's an educated guess, not just, ah, I think it happened this way. It's based on those observations that you saw. And so you make that educated guess, that hypothesis. Now, what do you do with that hypothesis? You've got your hypothesis. Step three involves testing that hypothesis. This is really important, and I think this is what a lot of people don't understand about science. Your tests have to be repeatable, right? So other people can repeat the same test, and you weren't the only one to ever do it. They have to be verifiable. You have to have actual results and, and where people can see what you did. It has to be rigorous. You can't just sort of say, well, I ought to leave this stuff out because I don't want to do it. You have to be very rigorous about this, and it has to be objective. You can't be uh, saying, well, I really like this better, so I'm going to only follow that, you know, that line of thinking. It has to be very objective. So you could do field work, you could do experiments, you could do uh, more observations, you could examine other similar phenomena. You, you basically are looking to, to try and test your, your idea. And this is the most important part, this thing at the bottom. When you test a scientific hypothesis, you're not trying to prove it. You're actually trying to disprove it. Okay, what does that matter, you ask? Well, when you're trying to prove a hypothesis, it's really easy to just pick the results or the information that really supports your hypothesis and leave all the other stuff behind. But when you're trying to disprove your hypothesis, you have to take in everything to see if something will actually disprove it and say, nope, this is absolutely not, you know, your hypothesis does not work. So I think this is a really important thing that people should understand is that when a hypothesis is being tested, they're doing it very rigorously and they're, um, you know, they're trying to disprove it ultimately. So what happens if you do disprove your hypothesis or you need to add more to it? Well, you might modify your hypothesis. Maybe you learn some things. You might, huh, I think I need to add something to that. And then you go back and you test and you retest and you retest and you retest and you rinse and repeat. And you might do this a lot until finally the hope is that if your hypothesis can kind of stand the test of time and it doesn't uh, it can't be disproven uh, throughout, you know, maybe even decades of testing and further experiments and things like that, your hypothesis might actually be, be become part of what we call a theory. Okay, now this is really important. You've heard of the theory of evolution on the left there. You see Darwin's finches, the theory of plate tectonics. So those are all the plates in the crust of the earth. This is really important because a scientific theory is not the same thing as when you're just walking down the street talking to a friend and you say, yeah, I have a theory that blah, blah, blah. A scientific theory has undergone rigorous, rigorous testing. It may have been tested and, uh, and worked on for decades and it can't be, or it hasn't been up to that point. It hasn't been disproven. Now, it doesn't mean that certain parts of that theory won't change, elements of it. We changed uh, the way we understand how plate tectonics works. We've changed a little bit about how we understand uh, uh, evolution. But the idea, the theory, the overarching theory of evolution or plate tectonics still stands after decades, or in this case, more than a century. So this is really important to understand when you get the results from what a scientist says, and like, hey, we came up with these results. They didn't just guess at that. They didn't just decide to do it in two seconds. They really worked hard on it and they spent a lot of time um, following this methodology. So here's the beauty of the scientific method. When you finally come up with your answer, does it ever change? Yeah, it's not, it's not something that's like, okay, I got my answer. It's never going to change. Boom, we're here. We have truth or the fact. The great thing about science and the scientific method is that it allows for change as we develop new technology, as we develop uh, new methods or, or new information becomes available, we might actually start changing our ideas based on uh, using this methodology. So it's a, it's a, 
a constantly evolving thing. And I, I have two pictures here, one of butter and one of margarine. Well, when I was a little kid, some of you might remember this, butter was going to kill us all. I mean, fat. The fat from butter was clogging our arteries and we were all going to die. And margarine was going to save the world because margarine didn't have all that cholesterol. Well, yeah, we've learned that cholesterol and fat aren't great for you. But since then, we've also learned that partially hydrogenated oils, things like that are really bad for you. So we've changed our ideas about how butter and margarine should relate to our health and to our lives. This is just one little example. It doesn't necessarily mean that the entire idea can be thrown out the window, but we can modify and we can continue to, to work with this. And that's what science, scientists are always doing. Okay, last little bit of, of getting in the weeds here. There's kind of two sort of branches, or not branches, but two ways you can go into science, right? You can have basic research, and some people call this pure research. And this is basically where people just like, just because I want to know, I want to know how that happened or why it happened or what, uh, what the structure of that thing is. So this is, this tries to help sort of predict and understand natural phenomena and, and other phenomena. Applied research takes the information that we get from basic research and you're actually going to try and sort of intervene or change or use that information for an application, maybe an application in everyday life, something like that. So they are two sides of the same coin, two sides of the same coin, because they often go together. And here's a great example. So these four people, James Watson, Francis Crick, Maurice Wilkins, and Rosalind Franklin, they were the ones who really kind of developed uh, our understanding of the structure and makeup of DNA, which is what's right in the middle there. So the double helix structure and, and all of that. So they did the basic research to create DNA, right? or not create DNA, to, to create our understanding, to help us understand the structure of DNA. But since then, we've taken that structure, that understanding, and look at all the things we've done with it. The Human Genome Project, right? So now we've mapped the entire genome, and we know uh, what, what we're made of. Um, GMO foods, genetically modified foods, um, cloning. This is all, these are all applications that we can do because we understand the structure, the basic research that these people did. Uh, gene editing and even engineering. I love this picture on the right because it's a, um, it's a bridge called the Double Helix Bridge in Singapore. And he used the structure of DNA to create this bridge. It's really pretty. Another kind of fun one. Um, <laughs> You add that, that basic DNA knowledge to another science, which is paleoanthropology, studying ancient humans. When we've studied ancient humans, we know that there were three lines of, of humans that basically coexisted. Modern humans like us, um, Neanderthal, and then another group of much larger humans called the Denisovans. Well, we've done that study. We now know how to uh, examine somebody's DNA to see where they come from. And you, you add those two together <laughs> and you can go to 23andMe and find out if you have Neanderthal or Denisovan in you. So there's an application for it, which is kind of interesting. I don't know if I'm gonna do it, but. Um, okay, so a lot of people kind of tend to think of science as something that's sort of out there in, you know, it's in a box or in the ivory tower, it's out there and it doesn't really relate to me. But science affects every aspect of our lives, all day, every day. The food we eat, the technology, the medicine, the infrastructure, engineering, you know, programs about dinosaurs, basically everything that you know, pretty much makes up our society today and makes up our, our cultures today that really has a lot to do with science. So um, you, know, you take an aspirin, that was years and years and years of scientific research using that scientific method to tell you that that aspirin was safe and how to do it and all that. So it doesn't happen quickly, but when something has been examined by the scientists, um, it usually goes into into our life these days. Okay, another fossil intermission. <laughs> we'll be done with the words here. Okay, so this is, 
This one I just have to show you because this is just kind of um, <clears throat> shows you what a science nerd I am and what a paleontology nerd I am. All right, this thing, I don't know how much this weighs, like 25 pounds. But hopefully you can see the really cool pattern on that, right? Kind of looks like a reptile skin or something like that. This is actually the impression of bark of a, a tree that lived about 320 million years ago. It's called a lepidodendron tree or a scale tree. It was not like modern trees. And we actually had these in the Grand Canyon. This came from Ohio, but we had these trees in the Grand Canyon. We had them all over, um, you know, in places around the Southwest 320 million years ago or 300 million years ago. But here's the geek part. I was visiting some friends in Ohio. They took me to this quarry. I found this. I was so excited. I mean, I could have found gold and I couldn't have been more excited than this. And I shipped it home for whatever the cost of shipping a 25 pound rock was to get it home. So that is how much of a geek I am. Um, but it's really cool to think that there was this enormous tree that lived 300 million years ago. It laid down in an ancient swamp and its bark became um, impressed into the ground. So this is another one of my favorite fossils. And also I could do weightlifting with it. <sighs> okay. All right, let's see. So what are the superpowers of science? Well, and these are just my ideas of the superpowers of science. There are many, many, many of them, but why is science so cool? Well, um, science can take you into the past. So on the left is a picture of the rock layer called the Redwall Limestone in the Grand Canyon along the Kaibab Trail. On the right is the reconstruction of what the environment looked like when that rock was being laid down. So science, the science of paleontology, geology, sedimentology, biology, has helped us understand that 340 million years ago, this whole region was covered with that warm, shallow tropical ocean. And you can go back in time to see that. Science can also take you to the future. We can imagine and work towards things like um, remote medicine or crazy, uh, <laughs> crazy um, transportation methods. But science will help us both in our imaginations, but also in actuality, move into the future. Um, science can also be a, a sort of a place, um, uh, help you get to different places. You can go to places that you would never be able to go to. Um, you can go to the far reaches of outer space, places that we can't yet get to because we don't have the craft to get there. Or you can go into a tiny, tiny, tiny blood vessel and understand what it looks like in there and how blood cells, you know, red blood cells move and other cells. So that's another sort of superpower of science. Um, one of the things I love about science is that it really brings people together from all over the world. And there's a few reasons for this. One is that science is kind of, um, you know, what it, within your scientific study, you're going to have a specific language. Now, maybe one of you speaks French, one of you speaks Russian, and one of you speaks English. Okay, so you might not be able to sit down and have coffee together. But your, the science that you study will have specific terms that you will be able to use with each other and, and be able to communicate with each other. And that's pretty cool. Um, for science to succeed, it really needs to be cooperative. Nobody's doing science sitting, you know, stuck in a closet somewhere and, and not looking at other people's research or looking at what people have done before them, um, things like that. So it's a real cooperative thing. And then, you know, rarely um, is, is a particular scientific question just being managed by or handled by one person or one team. There's usually people all over the world, either individuals or teams, that might be working on the same thing you're working on. And so um, you will be communicating with people in, in um, you know, Latvia or, or uh, Poland or South America, depending on what your field is. So science has a way of, of bringing people from around the world together. Um, and that's a really, I think that's a, one of the really cool things about it that I appreciate a lot. And it just helps us understand 
our, you know, we can understand how our world works. We may not always get it right and we may not always understand everything, but when you're using science, you're constantly working towards a better understanding of our planet, our universe, different processes, and what could be more fun than to get to know how this amazing planet came to be and how our universe came to be. Um, so this is a really, these are some of the superpowers of science that I love. I'm just going to take a little sidestep here because I know there are probably people of all ages watching this and some of you might be saying, well, I'm kind of interested in science. Um, and remember, there are a bunch of different fields within science. Science is just this big, huge, you know, sort of uh, description, but you might be studying biology or geology or physics or astronomy. Those are all different types of science. But here's the cool thing. You don't have to do the, okay, you look up on the left there, it says researcher, right? That's what most people think of when they think scientist, right? White lab coat, test tube, um, maybe the pet pocket protector in the, <laughs> in the shirt. Um, and that's, sure, that is absolutely something that you know, you might want to do, you might want to work in a lab or, or do be doing the primary research. But here are some other ways that you can get involved in science for a career or, you know, just um, for interest. You could be a science educator. Um, you could be a science illustrator or an exhibit designer for a museum, um, a museum curator, a fossil preparator. You're working on cleaning and reconstructing the fossils or a science journalist. And all of these people have to use the current science for their jobs. So they're working closely with scientists. Um, for instance, that science illustrator, well, Carl Buell di didn't just decide, um, hey, I'm gonna make this ancient animal look like this. That's actually a, uh, pretty sure that is a little Triassic or 225 million year old um, sort of early mammalian creature. Well, he didn't just decide that. He worked with the paleontologist, he worked with the botanists to figure out what kind of plants would be in that little creature's environment. So um, although you might not be doing the primary research, these are all ways that you can bring science into a career, which is kind of cool, I think. Um, all right, last fossil intermission. These are the really cool ones. Had to bring some dinosaur fossils. Okay, this is gonna be another little story. <clears throat> this guy. Everybody loves this guy. <laughs> so I will say this is a cast. It's a copy, um, but it is exactly, it looks exactly like the original fossil. And the reason that people make casts is that you, there is only one of these skulls. Um, and it is somewhere in you know, Mongolia or somewhere where not every researcher can get to it. So they make actual casts that look exactly the same, the size, the breaks in the bone, everything is the same so that other people can study them or I can stand here and hold it up and show you guys. So anybody who is under the age of uh, 15 probably knows exactly what this is. This is Velociraptor. And there's a really fun story. So Velociraptor, you can tell by his teeth, meat eater, right? He was the one in Jurassic Park, uh, the, uh, the first Jurassic Park that was stalking everyone and he was the big predator, right? Well, here's the interesting thing. This is the claw of Velociraptor. This is the killing claw. This is the one that was on his big toe and he would use this his, on his foot to gut his prey. Well, the Velociraptor that they did in the movie, that Hollywood did in the movie, was about three times, three to four times the size of this, right? Because this guy, hmm, he was probably, I don't know, you know, maybe eight feet long from the nose to the tip of tail and maybe stood about this high. You know, if you saw the first movie, Velociraptor's head was way up there at the ceiling. And all the scientists were like, ugh. Hollywood, why do you always have to make it so overdramatic? Well, here is a classic example of instead of art imitating life, life imitated art. Not long after the movie came out, a paleontologist was wandering through the Badlands near Moab, Utah, and found that claw. This is the claw of what became known as Utah Raptor. Utah Raptor is about 
four times larger than Velociraptor, and his head would have been up there. So there was a creature like the Velociraptor in the um, first Jurassic Park, but uh, didn't discover him until a little bit later. I think they might have brought him or something like him into the later movies. But this is a kind of great example about how um, art and life can sometimes inform each other. So I wanted to show you one other part of this uh, little story here. This is another claw. <laughs> now all of these are casts, again, because I don't have the real ones. If I had the real ones, I would have really broken the law. Um, this is another claw, but it's a different claw. It's a different dinosaur. His name is Therizinosaurus, and this is actually two-thirds the size of the real claw. This guy's claw was actually about to here. So when you look at these, everybody sees this and they say, oh, wow, he would have been really scary. He would have been eating a lot of meat. Well, when you look at the shape of them, they're really different. This guy's super curved, obviously really digging in to try and get meat and guts. This guy's claw is more like a sloth's claw. And so what we think, again, based on doing the scientific research, looking at sloths, looking at other plant-eating creatures that have big claws, we think he was probably just, you know, digging and slashing down leaves and stuff like that. But you can learn a lot about creatures by looking at the fossils, but then also going to the modern creatures, um, their descendants or modern creatures that live the same way to get an idea. So that's another part of the scientific method. You can actually move to the modern world to help you understand the past. So, all right. Okay. What is the biggest superpower of science in my book is that anyone can be a part of it. You don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to have the master's degree or the PhD or all that training. Anyone can be a part of it. And the reason I put these pictures up is a lot of girls think, oh, I can't be a scientist. That's less a problem than it was when I was a kid, but Scientists can be anyone, or people involved in scientists can, science can be anyone. So I want to talk to you about three non-scientist superheroes of paleontology. Anyone can contribute to um, a lot of sciences. Things like biology, astronomy, paleontology. These are, these are fields where people who don't have the training, don't have degrees, can actually contribute a lot. So these are three people. Harley Garboni on the left there was a fellow I worked with in Montana. He was one of the best fossil finders in the world. He was amazing. And also he did great archeology. span He wasn't a scientist. I can't even remember what he did when he wasn't out with us digging up fossils, but he was so good and he contributed so much to our understanding of um, life on earth at that time period that he has an entire wing of a, um, of a museum in Southern California, the Western Science Center, named after him, and most of the fossils in it are things he found, including that T-Rex. Um, Merle Grafham on the right was, uh, he moved to Big Water, Utah many years ago. He was a cartoonist and uh, an illustrator and uh, not a scientist. He just loved wandering around out in the desert out there. And one day he came across these bones that turned out to be the guy down there on the bottom, which is, um, his name was Nothronicus. If you go to the Museum of Northern Arizona in the hallway there, the entrance hall, you're going to see that same fossil. Merle found that and that added immensely to our understanding of these kinds of dinosaurs here in, in this part of the world, you know, 93 million years ago. He worked with people at the Museum of Northern Arizona, Dave Gillette, dug it up, um, and he went on to find a lot more fossils. So he really contributed a lot. And then the gal in the middle, Stephanie Leko, was she was just taking a day class at the Petrified Forest National Park, just sort of a be a paleontologist for a day class. And she was uh, digging around in this, in this fossil quarry that they t bring everyone to. And, you know, people were finding the things you usually find. And she found this weird little thing, these two little pieces at the bottom that you probably would just throw away. I might even throw those away if I saw them. I'd be like, eh, this isn't anything. She showed the paleontologist, and it turns out that that is part of the jaw of a fish that up until that moment was completely believed to be extinct in North America 215 million years ago. 
Now she completely rewrote the history of that fish in North America by finding that little thing. And she's not a scientist. She lives in Phoenix somewhere. And uh, so these are three people who really contributed a lot to the field of paleontology. And people do it all the time in every science. It's a little harder in certain sciences than others, but you can contribute without having to have that degree. So what kind of superpowers do you have to have to, uh, to have fun with science? Well, there's really only one really important superpower, and that is, no, you do not have to have a Mars rover, but you do have to have curiosity. This is the kind of curiosity I mean. You need to um, want to learn. You need to want to have your eyes open and to, to sort of want to understand what's going on. Just be curious about the world. That's the biggest sort of superpower, I think, that someone needs to have to be involved in science. Um, even Albert Einstein said that he has no special talents. He's just incredibly curious. Oh, and he dabbled in astrophysics. But anyway, um, so it's really important to have an open mind and a curious mind. Okay, how to do cool things with science if, you, uh, if you're not a scientist. And some of these, you will actually help scientists with their work in many ways. Okay, just stay really, clo really close to home. You don't want to go anywhere. I kid you not. Get on YouTube. There's lots of really cool stuff. But And I'm, I'm not chilling for this guy. Get on YouTube and look up a guy named Mark Rober. He, he was actually part of uh, designing the Mars rovers. He was a NASA engineer. He has the best channel. He will explain the science of what he's doing. He shows you how he has a hypothesis, how he tests it, and he does amazing things like that top one there, <laughs> building the perfect squirrel proof bird feeder. And he had a whole squirrel ninja course. Um, he is amazing. So you can actually really have a lot of fun with understanding how, how science works by doing something like getting on YouTube and you know checking these things out. You can take a class um, at, at uh, you know, there's, they have, there are classes for the public all over the place, local national parks, museums, um, educational institutions. This is that be a paleontologist for the day stuff. And you can see that kid on the lower left has a really cool, sharp, pointy tooth that he found. And everything that you find, you don't get to keep it. It goes to the paleontologist, it goes into the lab, and they look at it and they study it. And a lot of times they find really important stuff, like that little fish jaw. Um, you could volunteer with a museum, with a university program, a science center, an arboretum. Um, a lot of programs will, will take volunteers that don't have any um, you know, pr particular expertise. They'll train you. The guy on the upper left there, his name is Jim, and he works at the Natural History Museum of Utah in their paleontological prep, prep lab. And he loves it. He just He's always in there just preparing the fossils, and he's really good. Um, and the, the, the kids on the lower left are out in the field, um, you know, digging up fossils. So this is another way to get involved with science when you don't necessarily have a degree. They will train you for whatever you want to do. Become a docent at the museum. They train you in what you need to know. And it's a great way to learn more as well as you're explaining to other people. Become a citizen science scientist. This is one of the, to me, this is one of the greatest sort of movements in the last few decades that, that's out there. So citizen scientists get involved in projects that are being run by scientists from different institutions. And a lot of the research that you see and the journal articles that you see in these big technical journals re are relying on data from citizen scientists. So you can really be part of this. And in fact, in some cases, um, some of these data may even be used to make policy changes at, at you know, either locally or on all up to, uh, all the way up to federal. Um, for instance, you could, this is a program from Stanford University. They teach people how to do things like check water quality in your neighborhood. And they've actually been able to enact policy changes by um, using the citizen science data. You can do volunteer to do science with a national park. And again, they will help you. They'll teach you what you need to know. These are all in Grand Canyon. The guy on the right is digging up um, invasive plants. He's helping pull invasive plants. The two people on top are studying. They're standing in Havasu Creek. 
not a bad place to do science and they're doing uh, fish work and then the students down at the bottom are um, studying bugs at bu bu uh, down by the river so these are all things that these are citizen scientists um, here is a really fun thing and i just found out about this because of the pandemic the zooniverse so it's zooniverse.org. This is the largest repository of um, projects that use citizen science to help them, you know, to help do the project. It's the largest repository in the world. And so there are dozens of projects that you can get involved in just sitting at your computer. Um, there's the, well, you can see there, the second one from the, from the left is the Pelicams. So there's one about um, uh, um, penguins that, everybody loves to do. Um, anything from botany to physics to astronomy. Um, and it's really cool. And the information that you get from looking at the, the photos that they give you to examine, um, that information goes into their results and really helps them a lot. So um, this is a really fun thing that uh, whole families can do together. Um, I, I've been very impressed by that. You can get an app on your phone and uh, it's called iNaturalist. And you can go make your own observations. You can walk around your neighborhood and make your own observations and mark them down on iNaturalist. And what's really cool is that if there's um, high enough quality data that are uploaded to iNaturalist, they actually become part of what's called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which is, the, is an open source database and it's used by people all over the world for science, for making policy. So your information from the app on your phone could go to these scientists. Um, if you have iNaturalist, uh, you could also create or join what's called a bioblitz. And these are super fun. A lot of national parks will, or national monuments will do a bioblitz every year. It's, uh, they take a, a, a single period of time Usually it's, um, you know, a few hours, maybe it's a whole day sometimes. And you get out there and you just mark, you, you notice as many different species, you mark down as many different species as you can in that single period. And they're really, really fun. Um, so it's a, it's a citizen science effort. It's very communal. And again, these results are helping scientists understand things like how does species distribution change from climate change? Um, you know, where are things moving to? How do human and uh, animal or plant interactions change? So this is all information that, again, you don't have to be a scientist to do this. So um, these are some, I know I've missed some, but these are some classes and volunteer opportunities in Northern Arizona. Everything from universities to national monuments, you know, contact these places because a lot of them have opportunities to get involved, either through volunteering, taking a class, there are family opportunities. Um, and I know that, you know, perhaps most of the people watching this are from Northern Arizona, but because we're now, um, online or <laughs> you don't have to come see this talk in an actual auditorium there may be people from all over the country watching this check out the places near your home because wherever there's a, a museum or a, a you know a, a university or a national monument something like that you can usually find pl uh, ways to get involved with the science even if you don't want to go get a master's degree or a phd in some particular form of science um, but it's really fun to get involved. So you may not make very much money. <laughs> this is Merle. And <laughs> he sent me that a long time ago. I love that picture. You may not make very much money doing, doing the science of your choice. Um, but you will always go to amazing places. You will get to learn incredible things. You will see incredible things and you will, come to understand um, a little bit more about how our world works, how things got to be the way they are, and how things might change in the future. And I just don't think there's any um, better thing that you could do with your time. In addition, you learn more about what went into creating the things that we use, eat, whatever, in our lives every day. 
I think that's really good to know also. So um, get out there, do some science. And I want to thank everybody, all the organizations, all the individuals who helped make the Flagstaff Festival of Science possible. Um, it is really, an, as I said in the beginning, an extraordinary event. I am incredibly honored to be a part of it this year. Um, and yes, it's one of the things we love about living in Flagstaff. So thank you so much. Get out there, do some science. Bye.